Thank you, everybody, for getting on COVID-19 uh, weekly webinar tonight. Tonight we have a good friend of mine, Norm. We've been going back now probably 10, 15 years. I I've been in his house. About 10, 15 years, time flies. And uh, I remember I remember he left at the end of uh, – in the beginning of 2011, 2010, he was getting packing up. So I just remember just uh, packing uh, – staying at his house. Uh, right before I ran a marathon in 2010. Yeah. And when I look at it, the last time I ran for long distances, I think about him running in Sacramento, and I tell everybody they should not get off of the bucket list. But Norm is yeah. a really good friend of mine. He's been traveling uh, uh, outside of the country for the last 10 years. So I wanted to say thanks again, Norm, for just getting on the webinar tonight. Thanks yeah, again, man. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much for having me. It's awesome to see you again. I'm super glad we could reconnect. Right. So right now, uh, right now, Norm, first and foremost, man, what really made you decide to say, what the hell would this country just really move out the country? Well, so it was 2011 that you're alluding to, and uh, I was living in Sacramento. You were in the Bay Area, you know, but we right. so everything was going pretty well. I mean, good business. I was in real estate and mortgage like everyone else. I had a, a fun house that you know well, that you, uh, you had a couple parties there as well, you know, but... Uh, even after the crash, I had, I had rebounded and was doing okay, but it basically, my whole life, even when I was young, uh, with family, with my parents, I've always traveled, and I've always been like the beach bum, backpacker dude that didn't really own much, but had a lot of experiences and traveled and like challenging myself. So when I came to Sacramento, I turned into like the business dude, which was fine, and it was fun, but it was sort of like diminishing returns. Right. And when I was focused on material things and making more money or I built up a life that I, I had to make a certain amount to sustain every single month, it was diminishing returns. I got more stressed and less happy every month I had to had to pay for it. So basically in 2010, uh, going into 11, I went down to Costa Rica for a month to visit a good friend of mine, an American guy who, who lived down there. Came back after, and I was writing, which I hadn't done in a long time, and came back after that and uh, tried to get back on the treadmill of work and paying bills and the stress, and I was just like, I cannot do it. I cannot do it. So I decided, uh, hey, what do I want my life to look like? Like, if I just, there were no consequences and I could just dream, what would I do? And I said, I would actually move to, like, a tropical place and travel around, live on the beach, and write a book. And I will all right, well, let me do it. And so uh, that's what I actually did. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what was, when you first did that, what were some obstacles that you had to face or some issues you faced? Man, it's a lot. Uh, first off, when you're moving abroad, you know, I had traveled a good deal, but traveling, being a tourist, being on vacation in a place is nowhere near what it's like living in a place, right? So a lot of people, they think, oh, you moved down, let's say Costa Rica, where I started it's, you know, living on the beach and carefree, stress-free. There's no problems. It's just paradise. Well, you got to remember, you're living in developing or poor nations, even though Costa Rica is pretty developed. But, I mean, there's a lot of problems that we don't think about here. So whether it was the language barrier, uh, people trying to rip you off, safety concerns, just learning the, the new culture and etiquette and customs and trying to figure out where you fit in. Um, even things that are mundane, like, you know, in the States, like going to the store and buying something or renting an apartment could be like totally different in other countries. It could be like a huge adventure. So the learning curve is just through the roof. Um, but it's also, you have to treat it like a big adventure and you have to treat it like fun or else it, it really will get intimidating, you know? Right. So far as like safety, you talk about safety, how did you overcome that? Do you grab you a pistol or... I read, uh, I saw one documentary years ago with McAfee where he had a whole gang of troops around him in Belize. What do you do to overcome safety or what? Or what if somebody think about moving and they can't afford a whole whole bunch of troops and military like uh, Mr. McAfee did, what, what can the average person do if they decide to move overseas and, and be careful for, for the safety? Yeah, safety is an interesting thing, right? It's, it's really based on perception, right? So first I separate it into two, and I have this conversation with, expats or people who want to move abroad all the time or travel abroad. So first with safety, let's separate two things. 
political and religious crime versus street crime. So like, you know, uh, Islam fundamentalists that want, or kidnappers or political crime, you know, cartels in Mexico, stuff like that. You want to stay away from that, right? And, but you, you probably could know where that's taking place if you do your research ahead of time and you just don't go to those places. And then there's street crime. And of course, in, in many places like Latin America, South America, it's, it can be super dangerous on the streets. The difference is in the US, I think, the crime is more unpredictable. You could be anywhere. You could be at a bar, you know, filling up your car and gas and someone, you know, people carrying guns. You never know what, what's going to happen where. In, in other countries, it's more predictable. So, for instance, if you're in a nice neighborhood, you don't walk around flashing with jewelry and stuff, you know. You're not pulling out a $1,000 iPhone and waving it in front of poor people. Um, you're, you're just watching your P's and Q's. You're, you're using street sense uh, and common sense. Um, you could, you could be a lot more safe. So for me, I actually feel more safe abroad in most places that I live. Um, but that's after really getting to know it and exercising some caution. Yeah. Okay, cool. And tell but everybody where- I'll add to that, Jason. The other thing is what experience you're looking to get out of living abroad and uh, like what kind of expat you are. For instance, if you're at the bars every night drinking and carrying on and stumble around drunk at two, three in the morning. Well, what do you think is going to happen? Right. You're right. You know, so for me, it's like, I have, I have the, the 10 PM rule, which means nothing, nothing good happens after 10, probably 95% of, uh, you know, crime or muggings or robberies or bad stuff happens after 10 PM. So, you know, I, I keep it pretty clean and safe and, uh, again, common sense and, I feel actually safer than I do in many parts of the U.S. Yeah. yeah. I know a lot of people talk about wanting to go overseas because it's cheaper. Break it down because you've been to how many countries have you been to since uh, you left the last 10 years? Um, last 10 years. Well, last 10 years I've lived in Costa Rica, Nicaragua. Um, where else did I live? I lived in um, Vietnam, Thailand, Cambodia, um, and now Philippines. And I've visited a few others. I've, in my life, I've visited 45 countries or something like that. Okay. 40, yeah. That's dope, man. And as far as the cost of living, what's like the difference? Like, you know, I live in expensive California where they tax you to death and everything costs super high. What's the advantage of living overseas for as a cost perspective? What's like, what would be the difference? Yeah, it depends on what country you're going to, right? And there's certain countries that are sort of like expat havens. Um, and a lot of expats go there because maybe the cost of living is low, number one. Like you could move to Switzerland, that's, uh, but it's probably more expensive than California, right? So first we're talking about the lower cost countries where you could have a really good quality of life for less than in the U.S. Um, so a lot of times you're looking at rent might be 500 bucks a month. Um, you could probably rent something for $300 a month if you wanted 400 or you could go way higher, but you have more options at a much lower price point. Um, in, in, what's, in California, for instance, what's the average person, what's the monthly budget? Like five grand or something? I don't even know. You, That's you can do six grand easily. Six grand easily for a family out here. And that's not even like, you know, extras and extravagant. That's just the basics, just getting by, right? Right, you're not living in a correct. Well, in, in some countries abroad, I really think around 2,500 a month, you could live um, a pretty comfortable, you know, nice lifestyle. Now, if you're eating out all the time, if you're drinking, of course, you add to that if you're traveling. But um, for 2,500 bucks a month, you could, you know, and if you're disciplined, you could live a pretty darn good quality of life. There's some places that you could probably go lower, depending on the person and their comfort level. Um, you know, I, I always feel like I'm terrible with money. I'm, I work a lot, but I'm blowing money. I'm traveling a ton, booking airline tickets, going different places, giving to charity, just doing stupid stuff with my money. And then I look up and I only spent, you know, 3,500 or four grand in a month. I'm like, oh, okay, maybe that wasn't that bad. So a lot of Americans, I know, of course, from a financial perspective, in the years to come, there's going to be a lot of people who want to retire but can't in the U.S., that they're counting on their pension and Social Security and it's just not going to cover what they need. And they really live, you know, like below the poverty line in the U.S., right? Right. Um, 
and, and they could, you know, one possibility is moving abroad and for, you know, 2,500 bucks a month, if you could live pretty decent in another country and be safe and comfortable, that's, that's better than living like a pauper in the U.S., I think. All right. Was, when you refer to expat, are you meaning that you just, for say, I'm no longer a U.S. citizen? Let people know what really expat is. Is it being, yes. you know, forgiving my U.S. citizenship? What rights do I lose? What's the taxes on that? Good question. Very good question. Sorry I throw that word around, but uh, of course it means expatriate, which um, doesn't mean that you renounce your U.S. citizenship. For instance, I've lived in all those countries I talked about. I've always just had a tourist visa. So I'm still a U.S. citizen, of course, and you never want to give that up, really. Um, and that passport's worth a lot internationally. But basically, wherever you go, they're going to have certain rules for entry and for tourist visas. Sometimes there's student visas, business visas. If you marry a, a local person, then you could probably get a, either citizenship or residency. So different countries have different rules, but you could stay a U.S. citizen and still live in another country you could even be for instance a costa rican official resident but still have your u.s citizenship so you're not giving up any rights when you you still have to pay u.s taxes and file u.s taxes um but you're still entitled to you know like we talked about medicare medicaid social security your pension all of that is still in effect it's just like you're taking a vacation for 356 uh, days a year you know okay. Yeah. Now you, we always hear about this rift of this conflict, you know, with, with the United States and the rest of the world or countries saying, hey, people don't like Americans and so on and so forth. Do you feel a rift about being American in, in, in certain countries or what's your experience with it? It's interesting because the Americans are harder on Americans abroad than other people are. So our reputation has changed for the better vastly. Oh, you know, I remember in the 80s and maybe even early 90s traveling. It was the ugly American perception that we were, we were fat, which we still are, that we were rude, you know, that we <laughs> were awesome people around, that we were like arrogant and stuff like that. Um, either we've gotten better or the rest of the world has caught up and become more rude and arrogant than us because now actually Americans are considered um, pretty polite, uh, generous. You know, a lot of countries don't tip. A lot of countries don't tip at all. And we're throwing around money left and right on everything. Um, and we're, we're considered like we care, we do a lot of charity work and give back. So believe it or not, it's, I'm happy to say that uh, that perception of the ugly American is probably dead. And we have a pretty darn good um, reputation uh, around the world. Now, that being said, people are smart enough. People are very smart and sophisticated from other countries, right? Sometimes we think, oh, they're a little backwards or they you know they're because they don't have as much income or their society isn't as developed they don't know as much but people are very aware about what's going on so people understand that u.s people aren't their government so what you might find is a lot of anti-us government um not backlash but uh, uh, attitudes like you know trump uh your boy trump you know I get, uh, you know, every time I get in an elevator, they're like, oh, your president's crazy. I'm like, yeah, I don't want to talk about it, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> and if I'm offending someone, I don't care. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, and of course you go to certain places and, and if we have a conflict in those places and, you know, but even, you know, people have a short memory too. Even going back to Vietnam, there's absolutely, you know, the population is so young there. They just want to work and make money and live. They don't even care about the Vietnam War. Half of them don't even remember it. Um, so believe it or not, Americans are pretty warmly received. Yeah. So, so with that, so how are you doing all your banking when you go to all these places? Can you just go to an ATM machine or you go to the bank? You, how do you do your, some of your banking while you're out there? It could get tricky and it could get expensive. So there's ATMs everywhere, right? And they're going to take, and 99% of them are going to take your U.S. card. Um, they'll charge you a big extra fee. Not only will your bank charge you like an out of network fee, but the ATM could charge up to like five bucks each time. So, and a lot of times these ATMs have a low standard. You could only take out like a hundred bucks or 200 bucks at a time sometimes. So you're paying like, you know, $8 for every $200 you take out or something that adds up. Um, but there's, there's banks, um, 
you don't really use debit or credit cards. Now the US, uh, of course, everywhere we go, we don't carry cash, right? It's debit, credit, scan it, just, you know, whatever. You do that abroad and like, and you're signing a receipt or just electronic, hand your card over to someone, you're gonna get ripped off nine times out of 10. So it's, it's not like that, you can't trust. Uh, but with, with banking, there are some banks, like Char uh, Charles Schwab Bank is a great one. And they're of course a US bank. They don't have any actual um, like retail locations here in the US, they're a virtual bank. So not only do they not charge any out of network ATM fees, but they refund you for all those international fees. Mm. So that works really well. Uh, I still use PayPal, um, Venmo, which everyone uses in the US doesn't work internationally. You can't get your money out. And so, but you learn all these things. See, there's a lot of um, tricks to transferring money with different services and trying to do it uh, on the cheap. Um, but somehow it, it, it gets by, it makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So how do you, with that being said, how do you take care of your healthcare costs out there? Or how do you take care of your health care? Do you just keep your insurance, your American insurance, and it goes over? Or what do you do exactly? No, no, that's, that's another thing. Now, the good news is in, in some countries, health care is a way better system than the U.S. Um, so a lot of places, you're just paying out of pocket. Um, for instance, Thailand, place is amazing. I, I call it, when I come from the Philippines, which could be very rough around the edges, right? As friendly and as nice as they are, the country's uh, very challenging to live in and their health care is not great and, you know, just not, not very dependable. I go to Thailand, I call it Beverly Hills because everything looks safe and clean and organized and comfortable. The health care in Thailand is insanely good. Um, a few years back, I had some weird stomach thing and had all these symptoms. And for three, four months, I had no idea what it was. So I went to Thailand to one of the best hospitals and for literally like three and a half weeks, I was going in every other day and they were giving me this test and that test and a CAT scan. They had no idea what it was. And it just turned out to be a stupid stomach thing, but all of these tests, they would have probably cost 250 grand in the US. I think my bill was like $2,000, you know? So oh, wow. yeah, a lot of places you just pay out of pocket. Um, since I'm in the, in the Philippines now, most of the year and living there, I, I took out a, a, a normal health insurance policy. It's just major medical. Um, but a lot of places there's traveler insurance policies. So your US policy may have some coverage overseas. It's something to look at. Um, sometimes they just have like emergency medical services, but you might be able to supplement that with a travel insurance policy or even take out a policy when you get there. Um, but a lot of people just do what I did and they just sort of, they just pay, you know, 50 bucks, uh, you know, 20 bucks for a doctor's visit, a dentist visit, whatever, um, when they get to that country. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow, that's cool. Uh, so how do you get over language while you're out there? You've been in so many places. I know you're out the Matrix and know 20 languages on, like yeah. that. <laughs> so how do, you, how do you get over that language barrier with all these different countries you've lived over the last, for all these years? Well, we both know I'm not that bright, right? So I'm still working on English. I'm trying to master that, you know? But you know, when I moved down to Costa Rica, I didn't know any Spanish. And, and uh, as you read in one of the books I wrote about that experience, I had a lot of like misadventures trying to learn Spanish and saying things wrong and thinking I was ordering something else, but I was saying something totally different, right? Um, I learned enough just with you know, I'd write down five, six words a day, a couple phrases, and just try to do that consistently, that I learned enough to be basic conversational, nothing, nothing fancy. A lot of the places that you go around the world, if there's tourism, if you're going to a place where there's foreigners and tourism, they're going to speak some English. Even if it's limited, you know, the menus, the signs, the, the waitress, waiters, the hotel employees, they're going to speak just enough English to, to get by. Some places it's even darn good. But uh, English is still like the international business and travel language. So you'll get, you know, maybe you're in Thailand and you'll get um, Europeans and they'll speak English to the locals because they know they speak a little of that. Um, since then, since I've lived in so many places, I'm always like, okay, I need to sit down and learn this language. And then uh, uh, two years later, I'm living somewhere else. So it's not even worth it. So I'm like, I probably know like 15, 20 words or phrases in about like five or six languages. 
Um, but that's the extent of it, you know? Right. Now, you know, so let's say I, I get Social Security, I'm getting $1,000 a month. You're telling me I need $2,500 uh, to live somewhere. Uh, what type of jobs and opportunities is it for Americans to work out of the country? Well, like, what type of jobs can, they, can I possibly do to cover that shortfall to live overseas? Yeah, definitely. And the 2500 of course, you know, it could be lower in some countries or for some people, it could be higher for others at all. You know, if you're living in the city versus the country and stuff. But yeah, so the hard part is getting work, right? Um, the beautiful arbitrage is if you're making U.S. dollars and you're spending them in a lower cost country, you're going to live very well, right? So I still recommend to people to try to work in the U.S. still, um, but work virtually. So if you could get a job where you could teach online, you could coach on, and now, you know, now with the coronavirus and everyone working from home, that's going to be the new normal for probably what, 40% of our economy, 30% of our economy, right? But if you could do something online or work virtually um, and still make U.S. dollars, um, that's, going to, that's going to go a long way. A lot of people, the default is in certain countries, people teach English. Because they could get online and, and, you know, a lot of Asian countries, South American countries, um, they want to learn English. That's their gateway to doing more business and getting more jobs. So you could probably make, you know, eight, 10, 12, $14 an hour teaching English. Doesn't ta sound too sexy, but you add it up and, you know, you're paying, you're, you're, you're paying for everything you need. Um, getting jobs locally is a lot harder. Because, of course, if you're competing with the locals, uh, you know, the people will probably do the same job for less. But there are international companies, there are international schools. Um, so there are some, you know, in the Philippines, there's a lot of call centers um, and customer service centers that deal with international clients. So there still are some opportunities if someone's willing to work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, what's the one biggest thing that sucks about living overseas compared to the States? Good question. Um, you, you start, depending on where you go, you start missing the, the things like the sports, you know? Like, I can't tell you how many countries I've lived in, and you go to a sports bar, and they're playing cricket and Australian rules football and badminton, and you're like, come on, you know, this is killing me. I remember, like, uh, being in Thailand, and wanted to watch the NCAA tournament where my alma mater, UConn, was playing. And we won that year. I think, what was it? Nice advertiser, by the way. Yeah, yeah, UConn, baby, UConn. And uh, so I was like, not only the time change, but trying to find a sports bar. And I finally found a place, like, watched a game at like 3 a.m. or something. So you miss sometimes the sports. You miss the food. Um, you miss the music sometimes. One of the reasons I like the Philippines is that it's like a hybrid of U.S., California, Asian culture, Spanish. I mean, there's a lot of different influences, but they love basketball, the U.S. music, you know. Um, so you miss sometimes the creature comforts and you feel sometimes isolated or far from home, you know. Yeah. Based off you going to 45 countries, you live out so many places. What do you rank as your top five countries for people to consider if they are thinking about moving out of the, out of the United States? Yeah, good question. Um, a lot of people prefer uh, Latin American countries, uh, Central or sub South American countries. I'll give you my top five, but for other folks. We want your top five. Okay, you're the travel. Okay. Oh, by the way, I didn't put these advertising on there, but just let everybody know, Norm has a huge book catalog uh, and one of the best writers on traveling abroad. He has fantastic books from Push-Ups in the Prayer Room to South of Normal, Read his books, it's fantastic, uh, entertainment, uh, and, and you know, he has about five or six books he wrote so far, Norm, and uh, like fantastic that. books that he has wrote about travel uh, and his experiences. So, give us your top five places. All right, so I, I, I love the Philippines, um, Thailand's amazing. Um, Costa Rica is a great place, but I also love Nicaragua. What am I up to four? And to throw something else in there, where else would I probably? Uh, Cambodia. I absolutely love Cambodia. And a lot of those places aren't for others because a lot of them are really like Nicaragua, Cambodia, crazy poor and very challenging to live in. But for me, I also found they're very authentic. There's a lot of countries where you go to as an expat and maybe you have 
you know, a nice apartment with a pool and you have your restaurants and you have all your comforts and your conveniences, but you feel like a tourist every day. You don't really blend in, get to know the locals. You don't really feel like you're part of the culture and you have that authentic connection. That's, that's, you know, a lot of expats, they go abroad and they end up hanging out with other U.S. people. I rarely hang out with other U.S. people. I cross the street when I see someone uh, who looks like me. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I want to hang out with the locals and really, like, have that experience. So my top five list is probably different than other people's. You know? So when you travel, you're not just the guy who just sleeps, who stays in the penthouse suite and, and all that. You're a guy who actually like living in the community. It sounds like, am I right? Yeah, because, you know, the, the, the nice beaches, the, uh, you know, the beautiful scenery, all that stuff is great, but I'm not really there to be on vacation or go to a resort. For me, the people and the vibe and the community and being a part of experiencing, you know, a part of something, to me, that's really invaluable. That's what I love about living abroad. So a lot of those countries are challenging. They may be poor, a little less safe, more, way more challenging with like, you know, blackouts and this and that and all the, the, the problems. But um, you feel that authentic connection to the people. And to me, that's really what it's all about, man. That's invaluable. Yeah. Right. When I when I posted this on, on, on Facebook, a couple people talked to me about, hey, I've been thinking about buying real estate in, in Mexico. I thought about buying real estate in Costa Rica. When it comes to buying real estate, your dream home for, let's say you're retiring or that vacation went outside the country, what should be people be mindful or careful about when buying real estate over outside the country? Well, definitely, and there's, there's different laws and rules for every country, right? So they should research very closely. Um, there's, you know, there's Facebook groups these days. You could Google a million blogs, of course, sit down with local attorneys and stuff like that. A lot of countries have certain rules, like setback rules, like you can't buy on the beach if you're uh, not a citizen. Um, Sometimes you could get around that by signing a lease. Um, sometimes in other countries, you can't actually own property, but they say you could own air, not dirt. So you could actually own a, a unit in a condo maybe um, and, and fully own that, but you can't own the actual property in the land. So there's different rules and regulations everywhere you go. And there's a lot of scams. There's a lot of people looking to rip you off. So be super careful. I was just living on this beautiful island in the Philippines called Shergao. But, but it's, it's the surfing capital of the Philippines, one of the best surfing spots in the world. But unfortunately, a lot of money and people, the foreigners have come in and the locals are trying to cash in. So they're trying to sell them land they don't even have the title to. They're advertising and trying to sell them government land. I mean, trying to sell the same plot of land to four different foreigners. I mean, it gets grimy, so you have to really, really be careful and take your time. Um, I recommend, you know, everyone wants to move to a place. They go, oh, I'm going to buy property. I'm going to open a business. I say, slow your roll, wait a year at least, and really get to know the place, the ins and outs, where you want to be, uh, how it works, if it's even for you, um, and then before you start making major purchases like that. Yeah. Right. Talking about people getting hustled, what's your tips for people not to get hustled in those countries? Because you might be a language barrier, they're licking at you, you know, the wolves are out, they see blood, and they're ready to take advantage of you at times. So how do you go about being doing that? It's, it's crazy, man, and there's no one simple answer. You could use your common sense, um, but then again, your common sense is based on what's in the U.S., right? So... Um, it's tough. I've actually written tons of articles, even for the Huffington Post travel and CNN and stuff about how to stay safe when traveling abroad. Um, but there's certain things you could do. Like I said, the 10 p.m. rule, you know, just try to keep it classy. Stay, you know, don't go out late, get drunk, uh, stumble around. The best thing you could do, though, is befriend locals. If you befriend locals, talk to locals, then they're going to look out for you. No, I don't mean, you know, some scummy dude at a bar and, and he pretends he's your friend. I mean like real nice people, maybe at your hotel, your apartment, your neighbors, you know, people you run into, they'll actually, if you, if you are friendly and respectful and nice to them, they'll look out for you and tell you where to go and not go. Um, but basically, you know, when I leave the house, I have my keys, my phone and some cash. I don't walk around with a bunch of, you know, I even put, some cash under the sole of my shoe as an emergency fund. But I don't, you know, walk around with a bunch of my stuff. I'm not walking around with my wallet. Um, 
you know, there, there's a lot of problems and issues like that. Um, so you got to be careful. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Now, also, wow. So that's so you have common sense. Make sure you put a shoe money underneath your shoe. Any other <laughs> tips you were? Any other tips? So how do you pay your rent every month? You just go to the bank, pull out cash, and pay your, pay that way, or how do you pay your rent? I just give them my shoe, and they take whatever they want, man. No, I'm just <laughs> So um, interesting for, for me, it works different, different ways, but for me in the apartments, it was basically the landlord would come around or maybe there's an office if it's an apartment and, and I would just give him cash, you know, just go to the bank machine. Remember, we're not talking about taking out two, three grand. You know, I've paid anywhere from like 300 bucks a month to, you know, at the top end, maybe 700 a month, you know? What? Um, yeah. yeah. That's a month for rent. Yeah, yeah, it's high, huh? Crazy high. That's crazy, crazy high. For me, that's like insane. I'm like 700 a month, my God. But, uh, you know, for me, I'm like in the $500 a month range. I'm cool. But, you know, you could go to the cat, maybe the bank machine uh, once or twice and take that out and do that once a month. Um, but paying bills works a lot. You know, different countries, it's all different. But in, in this country, we get things in the mail and we write a check and send it back in, or we have online payment. A lot of times in other countries, it doesn't work like that. And you actually won't even get a bill. Mail doesn't work. A lot of places don't even have addresses. There's no like national postal system. So you might get a text message or maybe you get mail, maybe you don't, but you actually sometimes have to go to payment centers and stand in line and physically pay your bills. And sometimes, like in the Philippines, I have to sometimes go to two, three different payment centers at different times of the month to make sure I have everything covered. So it gets a little crazy, but like I said, you have to treat that as the fun stuff, and it's a big adventure because if you get frustrated by all of that, um, then you're going to go crazy, you know? Right. Well, just tell us about the quality of life difference you have now compared to you when you're back in, you're living here in the United States. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting. It's like, because obviously it's me and it's every single day, I don't see it as much. I think I'm like the same person and have the same quality of life. However, then there'll be certain instances or reminders where I'm like, whoa, it, you know, what I have go going on now is totally different than it was 10 years ago when I was in the rat race like everyone else. Um, I think you could actually slow down. You know, you could breathe. You could take a day off. Um, you don't always have to be in the hustle. You know, you don't always have to be focused on making money. Of course, you know, I don't mean to belittle people's poverty in these countries. People are trying to survive and feed themselves and stuff. But you could take a step back and actually say, I want to focus a little bit more on my health or my fitness. I want to, you know, go over here today and do something fun. Um, so you have, you have some more options. You know, uh, you definitely have some more options. And for me, it's, it's allowed me to travel a lot more, even within the Philippines. So Philippines, 7,500 islands, right? Wow. Yeah. So I would have, a, for, like, for instance, a couple of years ago, I was living in this, this uh, small city, big town called Dumaguete. And it was, uh, it was all right. It was boring, but it was really nice. And it was, it was calm and stuff. And I would work like crazy during the week. And then I would just get online and say, where, where are the... Uh, the flights going this week, like what are the good tickets? What could I, where do I want to go? And I literally on the spot would just say, this weekend I'm going to this place. And that year, I, um, because everything is so cheap, that year I flew 64 times. Flew 64 times in different, uh, you know, all around Asia as well, but all over the Philippines. So you could take a lot of little trips and see different things. The nature is beautiful. So uh, yeah, I guess there are a lot of changes in my life compared to having to wake up and be on the hamster wheel and work, work, work. And, you know, your only, your only um, real uh, benchmark of that is how many possessions or how much you accumulate. Yeah. I hear all the time, you know, people, especially when I posted this, people were saying, hey, I thought about traveling abroad, but I got kids. I got to wait till, I, till my kids grow up and get older. When you're out and about, you see expats. Do you see people with their kids? Or is it usually that single or is it just a married couple with no kids? who are just retired doing it. What do you see out there? You see both. Um, and it's funny, people say that all the time, like, hey, do whatever you want, right? I'm not, but people make, 
love to make excuses why they can't live abroad, travel abroad, go six months abroad, you know, move permanently, retire abroad. They love, and they go, oh, but I have kids. I go, I don't know if you knew, but they have kids in other countries. <laughs> I go, and they actually have a lot of them, you know, a whole lot of them. But so you'll see, um, you'll see young couples or middle-aged couples, retirees with kids, you know, and a lot of times the kids are, I think about the education they get living in a different country and what, you know, the friends they make, the experiences they have. A lot of times they have, you know, a great international school, even if it's in a smaller town. Um, so I encourage, there's really no reason why people can't do it. Um, especially if you have that, the job and the income checked off so you could still work virtually or something like that. The, the numbers, by the way, Jason, I looked this up, is about uh, any given year, there's about 9 million Americans living abroad these days. Right? Wow. So it's almost 10 million. That's pretty, 10 million expats almost. That's pretty big. I don't know what it will be after this, but um, about 24% of those are retirees. So you're looking at what, about, you know, 2 million, 2.5 million, something like that, of people who retire abroad every year. Um, so I was mentioning earlier th that a lot of people love Latin America, because think about if you're living in a nice part of Mexico that's a really good community and safe and beautiful, and there's plenty of them, or uh, Costa Rica or Panama or Belize or these days Ecuador. I mean, there's a lot of countries where people, and you're just one easy plane ride back to the US. So there's no reason why you can't do, you know, six months down there and come back and visit the US for six months or three months on, three months off. I really recommend to people, especially at first, to do a balance. Um, and then you get, you know, you'll enjoy coming back to the States. Uh, maybe you stay with friends, you rent an apartment, you get an Airbnb, make some money, you know, do your shopping, do all your banking, you pay your taxes, anything you need, and then go abroad again. But there's no reason why people also can't come and go as, as much as they want. Yeah. Right. And let's say if I did decide to do that, do three months on, three months off, should I go to an English-speaking country first, say like Belize, or should I go to like a Spanish country like Panama or Costa Rica first? What would you recommend if this is the first time you're doing it? I recommend uh, challenge yourself. Get out there. You know, the – the world is an absolute incredible place. You never stop learning. Every day, I get humbled. Every day, you know, I, I make a million mistakes um, and act like an idiot, and I stumble forward. But I learn something new. I have new experiences with people um, and connections that I never would have had in a million years. So I say, go for it. You know, of course, stay safe, but don't be afraid of the adventure part. Going to the public market that's just absolutely crazy outdoors and there's things flying at you instead of going to the, the big uh, air conditioned U S supermarket when you're abroad, you know, like um, I say really embrace those experiences and, and rough it. I mean, there's no reason you can't go to Costa Rica. A lot of people down there don't even speak more than five words of Spanish, but there's no reason why you can't uh, pick up, you know, basic Spanish before, during and after when you're living down there. So, yeah. uh, yeah, I, I, you know, no, I'm not going to re recommend like going to Vietnam and, and pretending like you're going to learn Viet, you know, and, uh, and complicated languages, but um, it doesn't mean you can't learn the basics and get by. Yeah. Yeah, that's how I when you, you know, especially now where everybody COVID 19 people working on is like how we are with Zoom right now. And I, I can see more and more people say, well, what the hell? They just live in California and that's it. As long as they have internet. Let me. I could work up. I could go overseas and live on twenty five hundred dollars a month, save that money, and keep going back and forth. That's that's really exciting, man. Think about it. I mean, if you were in some nice condo or some nice beach house in Mexico or Costa Rica, and you're waking up every day and you're going surfing or running on the beach, you, you know, bring your dog. You know, you have your kids. You're in nature, and then you go back and you you know, uh, jump on the computer and, and work for four or five hours a day, you know, and then do that for six months and then come back for, for Christmas or whatever, you know what I mean? It's like, there's really nothing stopping you as long as you have that box check of having some income. You know, I don't recommend to people just, just go for it when they don't have income or when they don't have a job, because that's just not wise. It's just not practical. And people sometimes fall victim to thinking that everything is so cheap abroad that they're not going to spend any money, but it could creep up on you. 
you know, uh, I call it death by a, a thousand dollar bills. You know, you're, you're like, oh yeah, it's, it's funny money. It's monopoly money. Everything's so cheap. And then you're like, wait, I spent how much? Yeah, so it's, it's still something to be aware of. But um, there's, there's really no, no reason these days, like you said, people can't uh, look at doing something like that. Yeah. So what's the checklist? When you say checklist, people should check off uh, making sure they have income. What is the checklist that people should consider before, before making this jump? Well, of course, um, when you're talking about what country to go to, you think of proximity to the U.S. if you want to get back, safety, you know, language, culture, trying to see what's a good match for you. Um, you, you know, you definitely need to know the visa situation. They're going to let you in for how long. Um, of course, income, job, health care. You know, uh, what's the health care going to be like there? Do you want to find a private hospital? Do you need insurance? Stuff like that. Um, transportation. Most of the time, people actually abroad, some, some expats, if, if they're actually living abroad, they buy cars and stuff. Um, and sometimes that's very easy. A lot of other people just buy little motorbikes or scooters and they nearly kill themselves on the road. I mean, it's dangerous on the roads abroad, you know. Um, but you think about transportation, where you're going to be. Are you going to be in the main city where you'll have more infrastructure and, and things available to you? Um, but you're in a city or do you want to be way out in a little jungle town by the beach where maybe there's only one ATM and there's a blackout every three days. And, you know, there's, I've been on plenty of calls, Skype calls, Zoom calls with, with clients and trying to act all professional. And there's a rooster going in the background and there's monkeys making noise over here. And they're like, where the hell are you? You know? So it's, uh, it's interesting, but yeah, there's a basic checklist of just things to consider. Um, and for your audience, if anyone has questions, um, I could send some of these articles, the resources, any of the books I've done about living or traveling abroad, I'm happy to offer them the ebook for free. Uh, and that, that'll give them a better idea of what it's all about. Definitely. And what we'll do is on the YouTube channel, um, after we record this, what we'll do is we'll have a link of the ebook and maybe some articles that you have. If we could do that, Nor, that'd be great. Yeah, and I can link to my website, which is, you know, just normrights.com, but that's tons of blogs about culture, about travel, about our world, about my experiences. So people could dig in there if they're super bored and, and read something and, and learn a little about the expat life and living abroad. Yeah. That's dope. Norm, thank you so much for the call, man. I think this is going to help out a lot of people, broaden the horizon, especially where I think California might eventually go bankrupt. And they're going to raise taxes like crazy before. And the quality of service is going to go to shit. And people yeah. think about what's next. Should I go to Texas where it might be hot and humid? Or should I go to the beach where it's hot and humid but it's a beautiful view every day? So I definitely appreciate it, man. Hey, Jason, thanks so much for having me on. You're doing a great job, man. I, I'm proud of you. And uh, you're really leading in the community and doing some great work. So thanks so much for having me on. And, of course, I wanted to give a shout out. Uh, happy third birthday to Zion, huh? All right, thanks, man, for the uh, shout out to Zion, man. I really do appreciate it, man. All right, Jason. Talk soon. Take care. You too, man.